Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Naomi Kropitsky, author of the debut novel, The Family. The Family was published last week and is getting a lot of critical acclaim. The Family is a Today Show read with Jenna Book Club pick, and it was chosen as one of Good Morning America's 15 books to curl up with this November. Naomi, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Well, if someone hasn't yet heard about your debut novel, The Family, how would you describe the novel? So The Family is about uh, two little girls, Sophia and Antonia, who grow up together in adjoining apartments in Red Hook, Brooklyn, from the 1920s to the 1940s. Uh, And they grow up in a mafia family, so their fathers are members of the mob, and they have to sort of come of age and figure out their lives within that structure. And in the end, um, sort of figure out how they're going to separate themselves from the world they grew up in and also how in many ways they cannot separate themselves and don't want to. So it's it's a coming of age with sort of a, a danger twist. And do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to writing The Family? I got the image of Sophia and Antonia first. So I, I it came into my head to write the friendship between two little girls who are really polar opposites. So Sophia is really loud and bold and more of an obvious rule breaker. And Antonia is much more introspective and thoughtful and quiet. And I wanted to see their friendship build on itself. And I wanted to see their their characters play off of one another throughout their lives. So we get to watch them fall in love um, with other people and have children and and sort of navigate coming of age with these very opposite personalities. And then I also knew how I wanted the book to end. And it ends in this very climactic, sort of violent way. And I had to get these two little girls in their adjoining apartments to that ending. Uh, and the rest of the world sort of filled itself in as I was writing them and as I was figuring that out. And what was your writing journey that led you to writing your debut novel? So I have always wanted to write a novel. That has been since I was three and learned that novels existed. I was like, that, that's what I want to do. (laughs) Uh, You know, I think more than anything, I think maybe even more than a writer, because I just don't think you can do this without reading. I think I consider myself a reader. Um, I am an, an absolutely avid reader. I have been since I learned how to read. And I just love novels. I just love them. I love being in a different world. I love having empathy for a character that feels really different than me. Um, I, I love everything about it. I love being able to travel uh, from the comfort of my own bed. And I wanted to do that. I wanted to make that. I wanted to contribute to the world that I love so much and have learned so much from. Um, so I studied writing in in high school. I studied it in college. I applied to grad school and did not get in, but was able to start this novel the next the next spring. So I only have gratitude for <laughs> the writing programs that didn't accept me that that fall. and And I have learned so, so much over the the course of editing and writing this book. I have become a much stronger writer through that process, and especially through the editing process, which was, really long and intense. It took about two and a half years to edit this book. I rewrote a lot of it um, many times. And I've really just grown a lot. So I'm I'm very grateful to be here. I'm grateful it's out there. I am grateful that my editor stuck with me and didn't publish the first version that we sold her because it's much better now. And I was going to ask, so that editing process you just mentioned, the two and a half years, was that after the book had been purchased? Yes. So that was lucky because I don't think that many editors have the bandwidth or or the resources to work with a debut author for that long. Um, but I talked to Tara and in our first conversation, I was like, you understand what I care about and you care about the same things. And I wanted to be pushed. I wanted to work with somebody who would push this book to be the best that it could be. Uh, so I feel so, so lucky to have ended up with her. And there have been hard moments, but I, I think that creative partnerships are sometimes, there. There's it's sometimes hard. Like good art comes out of working really hard, not out of something being really easy and natural 
a lot of the time. So I, I feel lucky and I feel like I worked really hard. <laughs> <laughs> and and can without giving, you know, uh, without giving plot points away or spoilers, can you talk about kind of that um, editing process and <clears throat> what kind of you went through in those two and a half years of hard work from that initial, let's call it the initial draft? So the there are these two plots in the book. There, I mean, now hopefully there's one, but there were two plots. There's the characters. So there's these girls and Sophia and Antonia, and there are their families and the way that you get to know them. Uh, and that's, you know, it's, it's historical fiction. It's coming of age. It's character driven. Um, that's why you keep reading is because you love the characters. And then there's this mafia plot. So there's suspense. There's some danger. Uh, there's kind of an action element to it. And when I sold the book, those two plots were completely separate. Uh, they didn't really relate to one another. And at the end, there's this big climax and it's sort of like these two girls that we've gotten to know and we like are in this crazy situation. Surprise. And I think the biggest thing that changed over the course of editing was that those two plots are now symbiotic. So the character growth drives the action. Um, and the action is sort of the culmination of of Sophia and Antonia's coming of age. And there's just no way to separate out the the adventure, the suspense from the character growth. And I That's think true. people often come to novels wanting to either fall in love with characters or fall in love with plot. And what I'm hoping for this one is that you you love both and it's hard to separate them out. That's great. Well, I'm curious, did you do much research about the mafia as you were working on the family? So I will, I think the main research that I did and that I credit for any sort of realistic uh, or believable portrayal of the mafia or of New York or Italian Americans, uh, it came from fiction. So I read everything I could read about New York. I read every mafia book I could get my hands on. I watched, you know, all of the canonical films um i ate all the italian food i could i <laughs> i really tried to get this sort of comprehensive feeling of the world that i wanted to set the story in uh so that i could create a believable setting so a, a setting that you can feel rather than i think in the best case historical fiction makes you feel like you're in another time and place and in the worst case, it's sort of a list of um, historical facts. And so for me, reading fiction and immersing myself in, in history and in fiction in New, in New York was the way that I felt like I could create the most believable world. That's great. I'm curious, uh, do you have, um, let's say, two or three favorite uh, mafia novels? Let's see. I mean, The Godfather is canonical <laughs> it right it's it's incredible and it's really it's almost impossible to have this conversation without talking about the godfather um and and one of my favorite facts about that which did did play directly into how i focus this novel is that the dawn in the godfather uh, mario puzo who wrote it has credited um his mother with being the inspiration for the dawn and I just thought, why aren't we talking about these women? Why, where, where are the books about the wives? Like everything right. that they're seeing and everything that they know. Um, why, why isn't that what we're talking about? That's great. Um, are you working on another novel now? I am just completely immersed in getting this one out into the world right now. Uh, so I'm really excited to be working on something new, but right now I'm I'm just focusing on this one and seeing what comes next. Sure. Well, I know that you have worked as a bookseller. How um, has that experience um, been for you? And and um, uh, were you thinking about uh, your book in a bookstore when you were working on it? So I started book selling uh, right around the time that I started edits on my novel. So I had sold the novel and I needed a job that would sort of get me out of the house and speaking to other humans and paying <laughs> part of my rent while I was doing the edits for this novel. 
Um, and it it really changed a lot for me because before I worked at a bookstore, I really wasn't reading very much contemporary fiction because hardcover books are $30 and I was working part-time so that I could write my book. Uh, and I was reading books that we've all been talking about for a hundred years and books I found in used bookstores. And I work at a store, it's called Blackbird Books. It's in San Francisco that only focuses on contemporary work. So we, we carry fiction, um, and nonfiction that has been published in the last sort of one to five ish years. Mm -hmm. And I have been able while I'm working there to, to just get a sense of what fiction is coming out right now and to situate myself in in the world that I'm contributing to and in in this world of contemporary hardcover like fiction that's coming out this year and that has that has really opened my eyes up a little bit to to what kinds of things are happening and it's opened my eyes up to writers that are working right now that are just incredible that I wouldn't have had access to otherwise um they are people just like you, people who heeded a call and played a role in history. You may not think of veterans that often, but America wouldn't be America without them. So why not take time to honor their bravery, hear their stories, and see the faces behind the forces at the National Veterans Memorial and Museum in Columbus, Ohio. It's a moving and inspirational experience you and your family won't soon forget. Plan your visit at nationalvmm.org. Some coffee's fast, but not fresh. Some coffee's fresh, but only after a long wait. Speedway coffee is made fresh at the push of a button, hot or iced, so you can have fresh coffee your way, right away. Get two times the points when you buy any size hot or iced coffee drink with Speedy Rewards. And, and I've been really grateful for that. And then just, you know, I always loved independent bookstores, but booksellers are, they operate almost as therapists. You come in and you're like, I want to read something, but I don't know what. And a bookseller wants nothing more than to talk to you until they figure out exactly what book is going to um, locate you. That's Michael Cunningham from The Hours, a book that that locates you in your life. Um, that's sort of the book of the moment for you. And you know, Amazon doesn't doesn't care about what the book of the moment is for you. So I I just really value the work that they do now. And. <clears throat> On that note, what novels have you read recently that you enjoyed? So I have a few that I've been recommending. Um, Charlotte McConaughey, I, I hope I'm pronouncing her last name correctly, has written two novels. Um, I think the first one was published in Australia. It's called Migrations, and then it just recently came to the U.S. The second one is called Once There Were Wolves, and they are beautiful. They're lyrical um, they're, they're speculative. So they take place almost slightly in the future, but, but just barely. So you just start to see the effects of sort of climate change and world politics, but without that being the whole, the whole thing. So the characters are, are really strong. They're beautiful characters and they're the focus of the books. The natural world features really heavily. So they're just beautiful in that way. Um, I think my favorite book I read this year is Matrix by Lauren Groff. It is astounding. Uh, it takes place in a nunnery in, I believe, like the 12th century. And so you start the book and you think, oh, I have nothing in common with this woman. Why would I? Um, and then it turns out that, you know, of course, you have so, so much in common with this woman. And she really, her writing is so beautiful. And the themes she talks about are, end up being really universal. And it's just immersive and great. Um, and then I have one more that I'm really excited about. It's called Beasts of a Little Land, and it's coming at the beginning of December. It's by Juhei Kim. It's another debut for this year, and it's also a sort of multi-generational family epic. It takes place in Korea, and um, it's just it's just gorgeous. So I think readers who are drawn to my book and to the sort of big family um, book that takes place over a long period of time, a book that is historical without um, a book that's that's historical and gives you a good sense of a different time and place. I think they'll love Juhei Kim's book also. That's great. Well, given your experience uh, <clears throat> writing the family, selling it, um, your two and a half year journey of of editing it, editing the the novel for publication, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels? 
Oh, I mean, first of all, I think just don't stop. So the days when you you look over what you've done or you reach into your brain for something and you feel like it's just empty and you feel like everything that you've been doing is just like a, a trash fire. Um, those are those days are part of a bigger process. And starting to see those days as like a, a necessary reset almost has been really important for me. Um, and it, it's really hard when you're working by yourself to feel like what you're doing is connected to a bigger project or the world around you or any kind of greater process. Um, and so just just don't stop. If it's important to you, if it keeps coming back to you, make time for it. Um, and then the other thing I would say is to learn to take criticism. Um, people who care about you and who care about the work you're doing and who are smart and who you respect are trying to make the work better. They want the work to be as good as possible. And I think learning to take criticism means learning to trust your own intuition. So hearing criticism and knowing what's right for you and knowing uh, what maybe isn't right for you, you have to be able to sort that out. Um, but there will be times when you get criticism that feels like you don't want to do the work that it would entail <laughs> to fix the problem. <laughs> and that is not a good reason not to do it. And if you feel like, you know, nobody understands my work, that is because you haven't communicated what you're trying to communicate yet. It doesn't mean that you don't need any help or any commentary or any sort of outside assistance. Um, so I, th I think, you know, I could ramble for an hour, but I, th I think <laughs> those are two sort of points that have helped me that I am every day trying to work on incorporating. That's great. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your debut novel, The Family? You can find me under my name many places on the internet. So Naomi Krupitsky. I'm on Twitter at that name. I'm on Instagram at that name. Um, my website is naomikrupitsky.com and there's information about upcoming events. Um, there's pictures of my cat. There are bad jokes. Um, and and I would I would love to connect with anyone who wants that. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Naomi Krupitsky, author of the debut novel, The Family. The novel is available now, so go buy a copy from your independent bookseller. And Naomi, thanks for doing this interview. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure to be here. Great. Stay tuned for a brief excerpt from the audiobook of The Family by Naomi Krupitsky, read by Marin Ireland. The audiobook is available from Penguin Random House Audio, wherever audiobooks are sold. Sophia Colicchio is a dark-eyed animal, a quick runner, a loud shouter. She is best friends with Antonia Russo, who lives next door. They live in Brooklyn in a neighborhood called Red Hook, which is bordered by the neighborhood that will become Carroll Gardens and Cobble Hill. Red Hook is younger than Lower Manhattan, but older than Canarsie and Harlem, those wild outskirts where almost anything goes. Many of the buildings are low, wooden lean-tos near the river, but the rooftops climb higher away from the waterfront, towards still low but more permanent brick townhouses, everything a dark gray from the wind and the rain and the soot in the air. Sophia's and Antonia's families moved to Red Hook on the instructions of their father's boss, Tommy Fianzo. Tommy lives in Manhattan, but he needs help managing his operations in Brooklyn. When their neighbors ask Carlo and Joey what they do, Carlo and Joey say this and that. They say importing and exporting. Sometimes they say we're in the business of helping people. Then their new neighbors understand and do not ask any more questions. They communicate via snapped shut window shade and by telling their children, it's none of our concern loudly in the hallway. The other people in the neighborhood are Italian and Irish. They work the docks. They build the skyscrapers, sprouting like beanstalks from the Manhattan landscape. Though the violence has abated since the adults in this neighborhood were children, it is still there, hovering in the spaces between street lamp circles. Sophia and Antonia know that they are to tell a grown-up before going to one another's houses, but not why. 
Their world consists of the walk to and from the park in the summers, the clang and hiss of winter radiators, and all year round, the faraway splash and echo of men working the docks. They know certain things absolutely, and do not know that there is anything they do not know. Rather, the world comes into focus as they grow. That's an elm tree, Antonia says one morning, and Sophia realizes there is a tree in front of her building. Uncle Billy is coming for dinner tonight, says Sophia. And Antonia suddenly knows that she hates Uncle Billy. His pointed nose, the shine of his shoes, the stink of cigars and sweat he leaves in his wake. Cross the street or you'll wake the MAGA, they remind each other, giving a wide berth to the smallest building on the block, where everyone knows, but how do they know? That a witch lives on the third floor. Sophia and Antonia know that Uncle Billy is not their real uncle, but he is family anyway. They know they are to call him Uncle Billy, like Uncle Tommy, and that they have to play nicely with Uncle Tommy's children at Sunday dinner. They know there will be no discussion in this regard. They know that family is everything. Sophia lives in an apartment with three bedrooms and a wide window in the kitchen, which looks out onto the no backyard access backyard. The landlord sits out there in the summer with no shirt on and falls asleep with cigarettes dangling from his thick fingers. The midday heat burns the places his body is exposed to the sun, leaving the underside of his round belly and arms lily white. Sophia and Antonia are not supposed to stare. In Sophia's room, there is a bed with a new bedspread, which is red flannel. There are three dolls with porcelain faces lined up on the shelf. There is a plush rug she likes to sink her toes into. Down the hall from her bedroom, there is her parents' room, where she is not supposed to go unless it's an emergency. Cara mia, her papa says. There have to be some things just for mama and papa, no? No she responds, and he makes claws of his hands and chases her down the hall to tickle her, and she shrieks and runs. And then there is an empty room with a small cradle from when Sophia was a baby, which is no one's. Her mama goes in there sometimes and folds very small clothes. Her papa says, come on, let's not do this, come on, and leads her mama out. Sophia has just started to notice that people are afraid of her father. At the deli or the cafe, he is served first. Signore, the waiters say, so nice to see you again. Here, on the house, it's a specialty, prego. Sophia holds him by the hand like a mushroom growing from the base of a tree. Almost 90% of women have cellulite. And guess what? It's not their fault. We don't choose cellulite, but we can choose a different way to treat it. Meet Quo, Collagenase Clostridium Histolyticum, AAES, the first and only FDA-approved prescription injectable for moderate to severe cellulite in the buttocks of adult women. This non-surgical treatment is injected by an aesthetic specialist in 10 minutes or less. Individual results may vary. Do not receive if you are allergic to any collagenase or ingredients in Quo or have an infection at the treatment site. May cause serious side effects, allergic reactions, including anaphylaxis and injection site bruising. Seek medical help right away for any signs of allergic hypersensitivity. Tell your doctor about all your medical conditions, if you have a bleeding condition or take medicine that prevents clotting. Most common side effects include bruising, pain, hardness, itching, redness, discoloration, swelling, and warmth at the injection site. Ask your doctor about all possible side effects and for product information. If you're ready to get to the bottom of your cellulite, learn more and find a specialist at Quo.com.